Good morning. I'm Dr. Mohit Nanda, an a practicing ophthalmologist in Charlottesville, Virginia. And it's my pleasure to introduce the next segment of the uh, Virginia Patient Safety Summit, where we're gonna be discussing the stigma of clinician burnout, breaking through the culture of silence. So I'm here in my capacity as the president elect of the Medical Society of Virginia. And uh, our vision at the society is for Virginia to be the best place to practice medicine and receive care. Our purpose is to advance quality healthcare throughout the Commonwealth. And it is my absolute pleasure to introduce our panel presentation for this morning. We all know that even before COVID-19 pandemics, extraordinary stresses for frontline healthcare workers, doctors and nurses in the US were experiencing high rates of depression, anxiety, and PTSD, and dying by suicide at twice the rate of the general population. But healthcare workforce burnout made international headlines last April with the death by suicide of Virginia-born and Charlottesville-based Manhattan-based uh, Manhattan emergency medicine physician and COVID survivor, Dr. Lorna Breen. So this panel presentation will examine the response to this tragedy at the University of Virginia Medical Center across Virginia and indeed the country. Members of the panel will discuss legislative efforts sparked by the Safe Haven Program and Dr. Breen's death to reduce stigmatization of health professionals' mental health needs and calls for healthcare organizations and individual doctors and nurses to develop real strategies to address burnout's root causes and create workplace cultures that truly and sustainably care for the health and well being of those who provide care. Through the Medical Society of Virginia's extensive work on addressing physician burnout, we know that the answer to this epidemic lies in the collaboration and by providing physical and psychological safety to all of the care team. So let me now introduce Dr. Tracy Hoke, the Chief of Quality and Performance Improvement at the University of Virginia Health System, who will introduce our panelists and moderate this morning's discussion. Thanks so much. Good morning, everybody. It's such a pleasure to be here. And first, we would like to thank, of course, the Virginia Hospital and Healthcare Association and the Medical Society of Virginia for inviting us to share our presentation this morning. I'll introduce our panelists first. Uh, we have Jennifer Feist and Corey Feist, co-founders of the Dr. Lorna Breen Heroes Foundation. Corey Feist is also the chief executive officer here at UVA of our physicians group. We have Dr. Pam Cipriano, Professor and Dean of the UVA School of Nursing, and Dr. Bobby Chabra, Professor and Chair of Orthopedic Surgery and President of the UVA Physicians Group. And finally, we are joined by Terry Babineau, our, the Chief Medical Officer of the Safe Haven Physician Wellness Program, uh, sponsored, of course, by the Medical Society of Virginia. And before we get started uh, with the panel presentation, we'd like to open this, um, open this session with a video. Uh, it, 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 we've been celebrating patient safety efforts in the state of Virginia now for 10 years at this summit, and we have talked extensively about team member clinician safety, but not deliberately in the context of clinician burnout and patient outcome. And this terrible tragedy has brought an opportunity for us to learn and grow and change the environment in which we give care. Clinician burnout is well known to affect the quality of care that we are able to deliver and is compounded by the moral distress that we feel when we cannot live up to our commitment to our patients and to each other. As you listen to this video and presentation today, please expect a call for future summits to share successful strategies to address burnout's root causes and to create those workplace cultures that truly and sustainably care for caregivers. Our purpose today is to share our story and to hear feedback from you. And so please invite, um, questions, we invite questions in the Q&A, uh, or you can send them to Abraham and he'll get them to us. Uh, like I said, we'll start with our video and then we have a few presentations and we've left plenty of time for questions.
My sister was beautiful. She was the member of our family who was the brightest, the smartest. She was the great aunt, the crazy aunt to eight nieces and nephews. Obviously she was a doctor in Manhattan. She was a friend, she was a colleague, and she was kind of our shining star. By all accounts, Dr. Lorna Breen exemplified all of the best qualities of a physician, but she found herself overwhelmed by the COVID crisis, even contracting the virus herself while serving as head of a New York City hospital emergency department. Lorna was the toughest of the tough. If this can happen to Lorna, this can happen to any healthcare provider. One of the many things that we have been asked since Lorna's death is what is our message to family members, to friends, to colleagues. And our message is simple. It's checking on each other and don't wait. And so while people on paper might say, no, health, mental health care is not a problem. It's not an issue. There's a stigma in saying, I can't handle this. That stigma is then reinforced by licensing laws in each state, many of which we believe violate the Americans with Disabilities Act because of the scope of their questions regarding prior mental health care and assistance for your entire life. And talking about these issues openly, we believe will save many lives and will help destigmatize not only mental health, but also suicide for this country. What we know and what we learned from this experience is that Lorna wasn't the only one. David, according to a new survey out today, one of four physicians knows a doctor that has taken his or her own life. Experts say this was a public health crisis long before COVID-19 and the pandemic has only worked to heighten the issue. We didn't understand at the time how bad it's gotten to be. And we didn't understand at the time how institutionalized it has become. And when Lorna became so overworked and despondent that she was unable to move, do you know what she was worried about? Her job. She was worried that she would lose her medical license or be ostracized by her colleagues because she was suffering burnout due to her work on the front lines of the COVID-19 crisis. She was afraid to get help. When my sister died, I said, this has got to stop. The stigma has to change and it's gonna happen now. We would like anyone who's watching this to join us on this journey. And we thank you for your support of all of our healthcare heroes and recognizing that before they were heroes, they were human and they need to be treated with dignity and respect. Dr. Pam Cipriano is our first speaker, and I believe she has some slides to share. I'm able to see them? Yes. Great. Okay. Let me go to full screen here. I'm very pleased to be with all of you today. And every time I hear from Jennifer and, and Corey Feist, I am just so proud of the courage that they have shown and the work they're doing to help all of us be able to address these epidemics. One of the things that I think everybody in this group knows is that before COVID, we had an epidemic of bur clinician burnout, and now we have a parallel pandemic. And so while we know that the effect on healthcare workers was bad before we ran into COVID, what we're seeing is just an enormous increase in the amount of depression, in the amount of burnout, in the amount of emotional exhaustion. So we know we must act together in order to address these concerns. Clinician burnout really needs to be thought about as a workplace syndrome. That's actually the official definition. And it's characterized by high emotional exhaustion and depersonalization and low sense of personal accomplishment. But what's really important to recognize is that it's, a, it's also a mismatch between what we're asked to do and what resources we have to do our job. So the demand uh, it, right now is clearly far exceeding the resources that people have as individuals. And we know that there's 64% more burnout than there was before. 
46% of clinicians are reporting that they are much more lonely. We've never thought of loneliness as an aspect of, of a, a driver of burnout, but because of the pandemic, uh, that's really what we're seeing. And we again, we have seen an uptick, not just in clinicians, but all of our students and trainees as well. So we know we, we must uh, work aggressively. For over four years, I've been part of the National Academy of Medicine Action Collaborative on Clinician Wellbeing and Resilience that again began to look at the drivers of, of this epidemic of burnout long before we had the amazing stressors of COVID. Really focused on patients as the center of our concerns as is everyone uh, focused on patient safety. We know when clinicians are burned out that they are prone to make errors, that the care is, is, doesn't provide the same outcomes that we would normally expect. So it's important for us to look at the two major areas. Some are personal factors of, of individuals' ability to, again, sustain sort of high levels of stress and, and what skills they have. But much more importantly, all of the yellow aspects you see on the slides are external drivers. It's how our, our organizations work or don't work. It's the burden of rules and regulations. It's organizations that have uh, ineffective policies. So it's a combination of workflow as well as the personal demands that are placed on our, our care providers. I'll share just a little bit more specifics about the stresses on nurses, because I think this is important. And while groups are, have a lot of similarities, nurses are, are really at the sharp end of a lot of the workplace and work environment concerns. One in four have been physically assaulted. This comes from an extensive study of over 10,000 nurses. Uh, more than half of nurses have been bullied. The stress that is normally pre-COVID ex uh, experienced by nurses is twice that of the general public. And we do know how to address some of these kinds of things, and that is to have a healthy work environment. So for over 12 years, the American, uh, the Association of Critical Care Nurses has put forward standards that you'll see the requirements here, communication and collaboration, uh, staffing that is safe and effective, recognition, authentic leadership, all of these things we know work and we want our organizations to adopt them. But when we hit into COVID, and, and it says nurses experience, but these are very similar across all healthcare groups. Uh, there was initially a major concern about the adequacy of PPC, PPE. Many uh, nurses said over 35% over said they went into patient care areas without appropriate PPE. Staffing has continued to be an escalating issue. Individuals were, were discriminated against because they were viewed as potential carriers and they were witness to many deaths, which is now taking a tremendous toll. But over 70% of caregivers felt extreme stress about the potential of getting sick and bringing the virus home to their families. And so what we've seen obviously is an uptick in anxiety, depression, and insomnia. And I'm gonna show you some slides that have been done by the American Nurses Foundation uh, with uh, sampling. This first slide is from December, and then I'm gonna show you an increase in just a moment. Uh, of, of resurveying surveying in December. And so from August to December, the, the red means it's a bad indicator and the blue are, are more positive. But 51% of nurses said they were overwhelmed, 48% anxious or unable to relax, and 48% irritable and 40% sad. Those have all gone up in December. The first bar is a new one, exhausted, 72%. Overworked went from 51 to 64%. Anxious, 48 to 57% irritable 48 to 57%, sad 40 to 47%, and depressed 28 to 38%. So we know we have issues. Exacerbation of not being able to sleep, not being, or, or sleeping too much, overeating, difficulty in relationships. These all, again, increased from August to December. So we, we really believe it is so important for all of us gathered together today to recognize this is a shared responsibility. What we've all seen is multi, you know, many websites saying, here's where you can get more resilient. Here's where you can find help. But we have got to shift our focus from, from having this burden on the shoulders of our clinicians and other, other caregivers and workers to recognize this is a shared responsibility. Our organizations really must make this front and center uh, and make it a value that we believe that, that well-being is really an important aspect of our ability to provide high quality care, bridge the gap between that mismatch of what's demanded and what we can provide. At the same time, we do want to make sure that our clinicians have access to many tools 
for, to be able to practice self-care. When you practice self-care and are healthier yourself, and mental health care is a significant part of that, then you are able to create change. You are able to stand up for yourself. So there are many things that individuals can do. And there is a stress continuum that we see, and, and we want everyone to be in the green zone. We want everyone to be able to be supported in the work environment with all of the right attributes. We don't want them to progress to being injured or uh, have severe mental illness issues and certainly the risk of suicide, which is the ultimate um, downfall if we're not providing support for individuals. So at, at the University of Virginia, we have what's called a Be Wise program and, and it's wisdom and well-being is, is our new name for that. But it goes through a continuum of activities where again, we are providing a peer support. We're really have, asking that individuals pay attention to the uh, con concern about taking care of one another and also making sure that we're addressing the workplace issues. The work and the work environment is one whole component of what has actually created a lot of the initial burnout and then at the same time addressing other stressors. And so we, we know it's important to be able to also, again, have these supports for individuals. There's lots of virtual resources, but it can't be done uh, with that alone. So I want to, to stress what was also said before. We have uh, a lot of concerns about the stigma of asking for help. And, and we want everyone to be able to internalize the message that it's okay not to be okay, which means it's actually a sign of strength if you can ask for help. The other thing that all of us can do is as we look at one another to be able to ask, how are you doing? Are you okay? How are you really doing? And how can I help you? So together, it also includes engaging the public. We don't want irresponsible uh, not following the, the requirements for social distancing and masking and those kinds of things. We don't want to let our caregivers down because they're telling us we need to stop the death and we need to be able to all do a better job in keeping everyone safe. Thank you. Thank you, Pam. I'll invite Dr. Bobby Chabro to make comments on behalf of our physicians group and our providers. Thank you, Tracy. Uh, it is um, a real honor to be part of this discussion, so thank you uh, very much. And I um, speak uh, um, from the heart when I say that it's incredible to see what uh, Lauren, uh, what uh, Corey and Jennifer Feist have done. Not only do I work with Corey every day, but uh, the Feists are uh, close family friends. And to see what they've gone through and to see how they've used this to uh, make the most out of a, a terrible situation to, uh, and, and to lead by example in support of our providers is truly remarkable. Um, so thank you, uh, Corey and Jennifer. Um, I uh, have had been asked to speak um, maybe from a physician perspective, um, but also as the president of the physicians group and as a department chair. Um, and I've struggled with burnout, or I've been on the fringe of burnout uh, many times in my career. I've, I've lost, and this is often hard to talk about, but sometimes lost the enthusiasm about coming to work and, and, uh, and, and performing my roles. Not only am I a busy clinician, but I, I, I have a, a lot of management positions across the, the University of Virginia. But I've noticed um, increasing issues uh, in my department, uh, uh, faculty members and team members over the years. I've been chair for almost 10 years. And, and a lot of issues that um, I often question, why are these happening? Why are these, these great high performing individuals having problems? Now in retrospect, I recognize that, that it's likely related to burnout. Uh, and, and I didn't recognize it before, and, and I'm beginning to see it more and more uh, as I have to deal with, with different situations. But you know, why are, are, are we experiencing burnout? I think it's because of our profession. I mean, we have a desire to provide exceptional care for patients, even at a personal cost. We don't want to disappoint or let down our colleagues or our patients. We live in a culture where there's reluctance to show distress uh, or even uh, signs of being overwhelmed. Um, you know, we're taught that it's a sign of weakness. I mean, I remember this coming through residency. Many of us, uh, I was a surgical resident. If, if, you, if you complained about anything or if you, uh, um, you know, said you uh, couldn't do something or if you 
admitted you were overwhelmed. You were told that that's a sign of weakness. That's the culture we live in. Um, and it's very difficult for providers to, I mean, they struggle to find balance and maintain resilience and determination to accomplish goals despite obstacles they cannot control. Many of these obstacles are societal and systemic. They're system issues. And, and we don't have control over it, yet we don't wanna disappoint our colleagues and patients. We wanna provide exceptional care, often when we don't have the resources to do so. And, and that leads to, in many situations, moral injury, and it makes it difficult for us uh, to perform at the levels that we want to perform at. Physical and mental health systems can be manifest in any healthy individual under stress. I've begun to see that day in and day out. Some of the most highest performing individuals I work with, I notice that they start to crack and they've started to crack a lot more over this past year. Not because of necessarily only because of COVID, but because of the stress at home, they're worried about their children, they're worried about their spouses, their grandparents, their parents, um, and, and the stress that they live with, yet coming into work and putting themselves in, in, um, at, at, at risk, taking care of patients, um, you know, has added to a lot of chinks in the armor from some of the most highly performing individuals. Burnout was a major problem before COVID, but COVID has thrust it into the spotlight, and it's now a healthcare crisis. There should be no question about that burnout is an absolute healthcare crisis right now. Burnout leads to medical errors. It leads to lack of engagement. Excessive stress and fatigue impacts interest and interaction with our teams and care for our patients. I would like to share a few statistics that I think may, may be surprising, but are just alarming to see in general. 50% of physicians experience burnout in some form, often as a result of moral injuries and the disparities in healthcare that they have to deal with. And these issues have been uh, aggravated burnout during COVID. A 1% increase in physician burnout increases the chance of a physician reducing work hours in the next two years by 40%. The US Health and Human Services predicts that there will be a physician shortage of 90,000 physicians by 2025 and burnout is the number one driver of this. So focus over the last decade in medicine has been, and rightfully so, has been on patient experience, cost reduction, population health. But what if we also focus on improving the work environment for our providers? So this is truly a call to action because before the consequences become more severe. This focus should be on preventing burnout and not just treating it after it happens, which is the situation we're in currently. So where are the opportunities to better support our providers and prevent burnout? Self-care and physician wellness programs are incredibly important, but they have to complement other burnout initiatives. You can't put the burden uh, on just the providers themselves to take care of themselves. The, the, these initiatives are, are wonderful. Many of the health systems have these initiatives, um, but they're not enough. And there has to be more work done at the system level. So, so what, what needs to be done at the system level? I, I think you can categorize these into to intermediate term, medium term, medium term, and me, uh, medium term and long term uh, changes. The inter, inter, immediate term should be to expand mental health services for physicians and providers, encourage providers to seek care before it's too late, create a safe and confidential environment create a culture where providers are encouraged to speak up when hurting and elim eliminate the feeling they are letting their colleagues and patients down. Support proactive mental health treatment for providers and create a safe haven. Basically HIPAA for physicians. Do not report for licensure requirements. The stigma associated with receiving mental health care currently for, physici for physicians impact their job opportunities and their life forever. And that's unacceptable. And it leads to people not speaking out when they need help. And then you see the consequences of that when they don't get help. From a medium term, medium term standpoint, you need to improve the usability of the EHR. You need to in increase physician engagement and design of EHR. One of the biggest causes of, of burnout among nurses, physicians, providers is the EHR. It is not user friendly and it was not designed for with the providers as the first thought as to for usability. 
uh, the documentation requirements by government payers are excessive. You need to make the EHR about helping physicians and providers be more physician, uh, efficient and provide better care for patients and not just about finances for the hospitals and the health system. There needs to be more application program interfaces to improve usability. You should be a, a physician, a provider, a nurse should be able to do what they need to do on their cell phone. We can do just about anything on our cell phone. Why can't we use the EHR like we can do other applications? There's so many ways you can decrease the burden requirements, uh, the, the documentation requirements, and a lot of the requirements that have been thrust on physicians and providers and nurses by insurance companies. Uh, and that has really led to burnout. So physicians, providers, and nurses have to be the ones that make the changes to the EHR that make it more efficient and more beneficial for uh, our caregivers. From a long-term standpoint, every health system should have an executive, executive level chief wellness officer. And this is an individual who actually has power and ability and a budget. And that person should study the health system environment and collaborate with providers across the institution. They should help implement strategies that reduce and prevent burnout, not only treat burnout after it happens, and they need to follow progress with metrics and dashboards. We, do, we look at metrics and dashboards every day when it comes to quality. We need to start looking at metrics and dashboards on how we're best supporting our providers and how we're preventing burnout. And you, these, these chief wellness officers need to report findings and be transparent, and they need to work with other institutions to disseminate strategies. They can't work in a silo. All health systems are struggling with burnout of their providers. They should be working together to solve the problem. And this will only work if all stakeholders are committed to education in preventing and treating burnout. So who are the stakeholders? Yes, the health systems, the health plans, state and federal agencies, medical schools need to educate their students on how to deal with burnout and deal with stress and fatigue, residency and fellowship programs, EHR vendors, board of medicines, and physicians and providers, we have to be part of the uh, solution and we have to be the ta at the table when we're discussing ways to support our providers. So, so that's um, you know, a little bit that I've been learning and, and experiencing over the last several years in, in, in my roles here at the University of Virginia, but I hope that information uh, was helpful. But this, re I really request that, uh, you know, this is a call to action. We need to, to, to step up and help our providers across uh, healthcare and medicine now. And we really need to focus on preventing burnout and not treating burnout after it happens. So um, I know we'll have questions later on this session, but thank you again for the opportunity to speak in this panel. Thanks, Bobby. Jen and Corey, we're all awed by your courage and your willingness to share with us. Can you tell us a little bit about your journey and uh, what you've experienced since this tragedy in your family? Yes, thank you so much for inviting us. Um, and thanks uh, to all of you for who've spoken before us. Um, it's interesting of everybody on this call, I may be the only one who has nothing to do with the healthcare industry. Uh, uh, what I can tell you is watching that video about my sister is unbelievable, right? It, it was my sister and it's completely unbelievable. Um, and what I can say is when it happened, we started hearing people saying, oh yeah, burnout in healthcare is really high. Suicide is really high. And I, you know, I was like, what, how, wh how is that possible? Um, interestingly, my father is an 82 year old retired uh, trauma surgeon. He trained at the University of Virginia. My uh, brother is a radiologist. My mother is a nurse. She also trained at the University of Virginia and worked there. Um, and of course my sister Lorna was an ER doctor. I had a conversation with my dad recently who was sent a book on uh, burnout in the healthcare profession. And he read the book and he said, I had no idea that's what that was. And we were all, you know, we've all been stressed and we've all been scared and we didn't know what to do. And I just thought I was weak. I didn't realize that that was a thing. Um, and so when my sister died, Corey and I made a decision um, to try to stop the bleeding on the rest of the healthcare industry, frankly. Uh, this is an occupational hazard that should not be accepted or acceptable. And um, I've heard a lot of comments about uh, this is not the duty of the healthcare provider. And I completely agree. 
um, what we know is that people get into situations where they have incredible stress. And of course, this again happened, this pre-pandemic, it's just magnified um, by the pandemic, but people get into these situations of severe stress and then there's no infrastructure for them to do anything about it. There's no help that's available without potentially losing your career, losing your license, being penalized with your credentialing, or frankly, just being judged by your colleagues. Um, so you've got this stress and you can't do anything about it. So what do you do? You just stuff it down and stuff it down and stuff it down. Uh, what we know, of course, is there's so much data to show the correlation between burnout and medical error. So um, even for people who are not in the healthcare industry, this is a huge problem because we are all users of healthcare, even if we don't work in the field. Um, and, and I think that the one thing that I, I am happy to see that has come of this implausible tragedy in my family is I do believe people are talking about it. Uh, Corey and I have heard from so many people in healthcare who have said, I didn't realize what was happening until I read about your sister and I stopped everything and figured out what to do and how to help myself and how to take care of myself and my family first. Um, so many people, we just got uh, contacted by somebody yesterday who said a whole group of healthcare providers in New York when they heard my sister's story uh, all started checking in with each other. I do believe that in the healthcare industry, people need to say, are you okay? Um, and if you're not, that's okay. It's okay not to be okay. Um, I, I will let uh, Corey talk about some of the details of our work, but I can say that um, I am just so incredibly proud to be uh, a resident of Virginia, also born in Charlottesville, um, because Tem uh, Senator Tim Kaine has introduced legislation in support of the well being of healthcare providers throughout the United States. Um, that's been a huge um, benefit that's come from this tragedy. And we're very thankful to Senator Kane and everybody else who supported it. So I'm gonna let you. Sure, just a, just a few a few additions to Jennifer's excellent comments and the, and the feedback that we've heard so far. Um, as someone who's spent a career in healthcare, I too was shocked at how bad it had gotten. Um, we don't. We we often look to large industry like the armed forces and the military as having a big burnout problem, issues with PTSD. But we forgot that our whole workforce in the healthcare uh, space was also suffering, but just continuing to suffer in silence. And so, it's been just remarkable to hear the stories of of individuals who have reached out to us, who by just talking about these issues have sought help and obtained help and it's really changed their lives. So we spend a lot of time in healthcare talking about complex systems and complex solutions to those systems. And we spend a lot of time doing research and we spend a lot of time talking about what we need to do. What Jennifer and I wanna send the message today is we just need to start doing. And let's not let perfect be the enemy of good because we are so far from good folks, it is, it is remarkable. And so some of these things cost exactly $0 checking in on your colleagues, taking that extra pause and tapping someone on the shoulder, uh, of, you know, from a distance, of course, now, um, and saying, no, how, you, how are you really? Um, sending them a text message. None of that stuff costs money. Those kind of cultural change things need to happen from the top down and the bottom up in, these, in our health systems. And recognizing just that some of these systems issues, like as Dr. Chabra was saying, are longer term. But if you make the commitment and the culture change now, it's amazing what you can do. Uh, with just very simple solutions to, to some of these problems. So I want to speak a little bit about um, some of the industry response that we've, that we've heard. Um, first and foremost, I think it, would, it wouldn't surprise many of you, but it surprised a lot of the public that this was an issue. And we've heard from every group out there outside of healthcare that they're just shocked and dismayed about this issue for their healthcare workforce. And so we're frankly encouraging them to check in on the healthcare providers as well. But I think that making this a societal issue, whether you're on the receiving end or the giving end of healthcare, this is the right thing to do for our healthcare professionals right now. So from that perspective, we've been overwhelmed with really surprised by the audience as we've shared this message. And whenever we go on, on national television to talk about it and we brief the producer before and they go, wait a minute, what? This is really like a thing? And we're like, this is a, not just a thing, this is a really big thing and it impacts everyone. And so there's been huge surprise. As Jennifer said, 
as well, from a government perspective, the federal government has stepped in here in a, in a way that I never would have expected. This was, um, you know, civil servant 101 response by, Doc, by Senator Tim Kaine to introduce and now get funded to the tune of $140 million legislation that will improve the well being of the workforce, both in the short and long term. There's more information about that in the interest of time on our website if you want to go check it out. But it is really, really exciting work. And just today, the House of Human, uh, the House of Representatives, excuse me, is going to pass the COVID uh, relief package, and in that lies the 140 million dollars, which is going to be devoted to this effort. From a state perspective, the governor of Virginia reached out to us almost immediately as a physician and wrote an incredible op-ed that appeared in the Hill magazine. Um, on Capitol Hill using also a similar call to action to say we've got to make good here and we've got to take care of our healthcare workforce, as well as other legislators in Virginia who have now expanded the safe haven program that Dr. Babineau and the Virginia uh, Medical Society of Virginia have been so such amazing advocates for. From a healthcare workforce, we, we published in July intentionally on the best hospitals in America day in US News and World Report, a call to action to everyone, including the healthcare community and the healthcare industry to say, it needs to be a factor in the ratings of healthcare organizations as how they take care of the well-being of the workforce. Given, the, given that it's not only the right thing to do, but it's also impacting the quality of patient care, now more than ever, we need to come together and support those. So those are just some of the things that we've been up to. Uh, we're about to launch a very large nationwide campaign because part of what we've learned is many of you may, you know, everyone's on different, different, um, a different journey here in terms of how far along they are. And so we're going to be la launching a nationwide campaign with a group of other industry experts to serve as advisors to the healthcare community to try to get them to go all in for the well being of their workforce. And if we can work together in Virginia as a starting place for that work, we would just be incredibly thrilled. So I want to thank you all for the opportunity to come and, and share this really important topic now more than ever. Um, and thanks for the collaboration of, of, of my UVA uh, family here who's joining us on this call today. It's just so great to have everyone together. Thanks, Corey and Jennifer. Seriously, we, we know we put you through this multiple times because it's so important to the community, but we know it's hard for you. And thank you. Thanks. I do have a couple of questions already. And if there are others, uh, please put them in the, the Q&A and I'll add them to it. I think we'll start with Dr. Babineau. Could you tell us about the Safe Haven Physician Wellness Program? Sure, thank you, Dr. Hoke. Um, I am actually a family medicine physician and I am also on the faculty at the University of Virginia. And I um, also was a nurse, an, uh, an intensive care unit nurse. So I've really got um, kind of a, a, a pretty full perspective of, of some of these issues. I am the volunteer chief medical officer for um, Safe Haven, which is the program that the Medical Society of Virginia has worked out. What we did first was we started with evaluating the need. And so we found that just like everyone has spoken of, and I have to say years ago, um, I never would have expected that, you know, the Dean of the University of Virginia uh, Nursing School of Nursing and um, the chairman of the University of Virginia's um, Department of Surgery would be speaking so clearly and, and effectively about this need to change the culture for us in healthcare. So we went and 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 I just I I'm so excited about that. And I think a lot of that has come about too because of the bravery that Jennifer and Corey have had in sharing uh, Dr. Breen's story. And um, I, I presented a few times with Corey and I always talk about that and it kind of chokes me up because it is difficult to change that culture. So we at the Medical Society really started with evaluating the need, looking at what was it that was keeping people in healthcare from uh, getting some of the care or even coaching that they needed in order to um, prevent some burnout and also some mental health support. And we found that they did fear their boards um, uh, and also their employers finding out because there is this culture of silence. And so in uh, March of 2020, we actually went about and had um, advocated greatly and Governor Northam uh, signed into law 
the law that helps to uh, change that type of culture. Um, we've now advanced that uh, law this, with this legislation um, to nurses, pharmacists, and also students, which is the reason I got into this area as well. I've been in medical education for all of my career and um, went and studied um, about burnout a number of years ago. And that's what I write on most of the time. And when you look at students and realize how they change, nursing students, pharmacy students, medical students, how they change in the first year or so of their education, you know that this is hugely a problem. Um, this legislation is also now going to other states. And what the law says is that those that participate in a program like Safe Haven will not be reported um, to their boards unless they are deemed to be incompetent or a danger to others. And those are the only two reasons that they can be reported. Um, and if there are consultations under the scope of safe haven, those are considered to be privileged and they cannot be discovered in civil litigation. So now that has now with this year um, been extended to the um, nurses and, and um, pharmacists as well. And the law was created because even with the very robust programs, the University of Virginia, the, um, Dr. Cipriano spoke of um, the Wisdom and Wellbeing Program, which I'm privileged to work with as well here at UVA. And those are very robust programs. But what we found was that only 6% of non-physicians and 1% to 2% of physicians would um, go to those programs like we said, until we change that culture. And our early numbers have shown, uh, we're just beginning looking at the data, just like Dr. Chaber spoke of, is that 35% of the physicians that are entered into the Safe Haven program have accessed and used the, pro uh, the program. The Safe Haven program provides 24 seven access to mental health care and coaching. And one of the reasons that coaching is so important is, um, Derby and Shanafelt um, and their associates in 2019 who have been just extensively writing on burnout found that three and a half hours of coaching per year decreased that emotional burnout that Dean Cipriano spoke of um, and show, with a validated measure, they showed that it decreased the burnout and it increased the quality of life uh, score over the control group. So we see that indeed, if we can get folks to be in a safe place, in a place where they would be trusted. And, and this um, safe haven program is outside of employers, but within employers also, as long as we change that culture, we in the wisdom and well-being program, you know, we know that, that employees are protected. We just have to make sure that people really know that. And one last thing that I would like to add too, is there's been a huge focus on inpatient physicians, physicians and nurses as there should be because they have indeed been frontline workers. However, um, when we look at burnout and uh, increased stress, the uh, studies have shown that the same numbers occur in the outpatient, nursing and uh, physicians as well. And in some cases it's even higher um, because sometimes I believe that some of those physicians and nurses kind of feel a bit left out. And so we need to really think about all of us um, coming, coming together um, and, uh, and indeed doing some of the things that have already been spoken about. Terry, thank you so much for that. I have a question that's applicable both to Pam and Bobby. Uh, it's written from a nurse. And the question is, uh, how, how would you recommend that someone who's at the uh, sort of front line of care delivery, but lowest tier on the totem pole, how do you raise up concerns either about yourself or about others? in an infrastructure like the University of Virginia where there are deep layers of uh, hierarchy. Pam, I'll let you go first. Yeah, thanks, Tracy. You know, I think any issue, whether it's an issue of burnout, whether it's an issue of asking for help, uh, we need to make sure that our work environments uh, encourage and empower individuals to speak up. There should be no reason that we are not encouraging that. So I think uh, to someone who feels like they're on the, the lowest rung of the ladder or whatever, uh, like any other situation, you need to you need to find a buddy. You need to to go to that next level of person who has some authority, and you need to to raise those issues. 
uh, maybe your organization, if, if it's a nursing issue, has shared governance, which again is another vehicle to address those kinds of things. But clearly in, in this situation, if, if the issue is I need, I need help, I need counseling, I need support, um, there are multiple venues and avenues. There are multiple programs if you're part of an organization. So part of it is I think seeking that help on your own, but much more importantly and more effectively is to find a peer who you can talk to, who can help you, who can hold your hand through that journey of, of maybe mustering a little bit more courage to speak up and don't take no for an answer. Thanks, Pam. Bobby? Yes, um, I, I agree completely with Pam, but I think ultimately it comes down to changing the culture in, in our environments. I mean, we, the people, so not only do you have to take change the culture where it's okay to speak up and it's okay to ask for help and it's not a sign of weakness and you will not be penalized for asking for help. That's one of the first steps we need to do. But second, we need to create very cl clear ways for people to ask for help and get the help they need. And, and whether it's through um, the, the, the structure you have in the organization for your group, you know, you have a, in my department, I have a faculty member can talk to their division head or they can talk to their chair and we can help navigate that. But a lot of times people want to do this in confidence in some ways, and they don't want their boss to know about it, but uh, they still need help. And, and they need a way to do that that's safe, that they feel confident that it protects their uh, privacy. Uh, but most importantly, they feel comfortable in speaking up and creating those reporting um, or, or, or ways to, uh, I, um, for people to ask for help is gonna be very critical. And, and, and that really is gonna require a culture change in medicine from across the board. Um, I don't think, you know, I think all, all um, hospitals everywhere, or everywhere you are, uh, there, it's, there's a struggle for that right now as this becomes more and more of an issue that we're dealing with. So, uh, but I, I agree, you need, you need to hopefully have someone you can talk to and someone who can help you navigate uh, getting the help you need. And, and we need to clarify um, as, as health system leaders or hospital leaders, we need to clarify the ways that individuals can get help and make sure they have access to the help when they need it. And we have to make sure that that request for help is done in a private manner. Thank you, Bobby. Terry, I'm gonna direct this one to you. Um, this is a really um, astute comment. A question remains, it still appears that a person needs to ask for help or seek out care, and they might not even realize they're heading down a path of burnout. Can you talk about a level of ongoing wellness that can be pushed out at the organizational level to improve mental health and prevent burnout? Um, actually, that's a great question. Um, it, certainly, there, there are programs like, like Safe Haven through the Medical Society of Virginia, um, but there are also multiple programs all over uh, all of the healthcare organizations in Virginia and across the country. We're getting better and better at how we prevent healthcare burnout. However, I think exactly like what Dr. Chaba was speaking of, is that I've written about the individual aspects and in the same review article made sure that there were the institutional ones because I think what ends up happening is that we end up blaming, it's almost like we blame not a victim because none of us in healthcare would ever ascribe to that name, um, you know, but we're blaming the people who are actually putting themselves at risk. So um, yes, there are multiple programs. The Wisdom and Wellbeing Program at the University of Virginia um, has ways for employees to reach out. It's the Faculty Employee Assistance Program. And I think one of the things is also really important, it's so hugely important to me is I really understand kind of, I put myself through school. So I have worked as a nursing assistant I've worked at the front desks of units of the hospital. I understand, I mean, it was a while ago, obviously, but I do understand what that kind of work can be. And I think we have to look at all of the folks that are in there. One of the things that we do um, here at the university is try hard to um, encourage that, um, to number one, get a coach if you need one. Coaching is different than mentoring. Coaching is different than going to your supervisor. 
coaching is actually going to someone who might be a um, a leader in your field, and it kind of takes you a little bit out of that psychological situation where you're not going to them for maybe mental health help, you're going to them to figure out how to work better. So there's the two aspects. But if you need the mental health help to have the places to get it, which they most EAPs do have that, the problem is until we change the culture, just like Dr. Chabra spoke about, just like Dean Cipriano did, until we change that culture, we don't have people coming to use it. And that's what's the numbers I was talking about. You know, one to 2% of physicians are going to volunteer to go to an EAP. That's why we created Safe Haven. It's outside of the employer situation. Um, and that's why it's getting extended to the nurse, to nurses and pharmacists and many others and all across the country now um, because it's outside of the employer. But we also need, just like Corey and Jennifer talked about, and thank goodness they can give voice to this um, using their tragedy, which is just an incredibly strong thing to do. We have to change the culture. Tracy, can I add to that for a second? I, I want to put a really, I want to bring this down to, to what Terry just said. So when my sister-in-law contracted COVID and was trying to run an emergency room while recovering, while, while being sick from COVID, and then went back into that same emergency room after only being a Fabra for about 48 hours, but completely, de completely depleted, if one of her colleagues had tapped her on the shoulder, just one, and said, you need to take a break. We would not be talking to you today. Jennifer and I feel very strongly about that. And so one of the things, you know, this culture change is so big sometimes that, it, that it, it's such a big concept that you don't even know where to start, which is why we've said start with just tapping someone on the shoulder and asking them how they're doing. And when you see someone who's who might be struggling, don't wait and think, oh, maybe they'll get better. Just, just intervene, just, just move. Um, the second thing I would say is the federal law that Senator Tim Kaine is carrying called the Dr. Lorna Breen Healthcare Provider Protection Act has funding levels both for students, nursing and medical and other professional students so they can learn about this now so that they can recognize in themselves and their peers how to, how to mitigate going forward. And it also has funding for hospitals and health systems now to bring programs to bear. So I wanna make sure everyone connects the dots there to that incredibly astute question that you read. It, some of this takes money, but some of it is actually very simple, um, at least in concept to deliver. Thanks, Tracy. Excellent, thank you, Corey. Um, I can't agree with you enough. There are a lot of questions about specific tactics or um, ways to identify people at risk. And you're right, the human connection of one person speaking to another is probably the best uh, weapon we have right now. Pam, I'm gonna ask you one more. Um, many uh, in your history as a, as a chief nursing officer, et cetera, many nurses who are um, unable to complete safety procedures perfectly, including the documentation of standard work around central line maintenance or something like that, um, have said that they're burned out when asked why this happened or, or how this happened. Not that they didn't know to do it, but that it couldn't be done in the environment they were trying to work in. Uh, how do we address this without uh, alienating people even more than they already are? Well, that's, that's a tough one. Uh, again, I, I think we're all looking for ways to simplify the burdens in the work environment and taking the word burden lightly. I mean, yes, the documentation is really important. And I know there have been questions about what is actually happening. So nationally, there are efforts to simplify the documentation requirements, which is a, a huge dissatisfier for physicians. And there's, there has been extensive work being done with CMS, Patients uh, Over Paperwork Initiative. And so there are those kinds of changes. There has probably not been as, as much a focus in nursing, but I really believe that's something that at the organizational level, we should, we should be able to take on and say, you know, what are the, what are the ways that we think we can alter the am amount of work that's required so that there isn't this guilt, so that so that the nurse believes that they can, uh, you know, create the, the the whether it's documentation or the care being provided, and again to to rely on colleagues. I think you know when when we're talking about how do you get help and how do you make sure that that you're asking if others are okay. When 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 we're surveying people about 
what did what mechanism did you use to get the support you needed? The top answer is a, a buddy, a friend, a, a family member. So I think it it is also ap appropriate for the for the work environment. If you're really exhausted, you need to say, you know, I don't think I can get it all done today. Um, and, and you need to have that conversation with a friend because the amount of stress that's being experienced across, you know, as Terry said, outpatient areas, as well as the uh, COVID ICUs is really quite extreme. And so I think there has to be a little forgiving and we don't, because we don't want to add an additional victimization of, of caregivers given the stress that they're under. So again, I think it's that striking that balance within our care delivery organizations. Thanks, Pam. Any other comments from the field? We have only a few more minutes before the transition to the noontime hour. Anything from our panelists? Jennifer and Corey, thank you so much for your time and your energy. Abraham, we'll turn it back over to VHHA. So actually, Tracy, I'm gonna put you on the spot. Um, as we think about a potential call to action, um, what do you think that might look like? I mean, what should the VHHA ask every single leader of every single health system in Virginia to consider doing over the next year and be able to report out on a year from now? What would that call potentially look like? Abraham, it's a softball because we've talked about this, but I'm happy to be on the spot. I remember being on the planning committee years and years ago when the concept of a poster session was uh, thought of and it was uh, worried about because we thought to ourselves, what if we don't have things good enough for poster sessions? What if we don't have documented outpatient uh, outcomes att attached to interventions? What, what, if, what if we don't um, you know, save the world or hit it out of the park on the, the first try? One of the things that Abraham and I have been talking about is going out on a limb this year and putting together our poster session around interventions to improve the wellness culture asking for um, measurement, of course, as we're all now very well used to in our high reliability organizations using our scorecards and our dashboards. But it might be, it might look something like a different call for patient safety posters, but instead uh, culture safety po posters maybe, or, or, or very specifically team member safety posters around this wellness piece. And we're not gonna get it all right on the first try. To Corey's point, you just have to tap somebody on the shoulder and give it a go. But, um, but we will teach each other something and we will grow. And the posters that come next year and the year after will provide the uh, publications and manuscripts, et cetera, that our legislators use to mature the laws that they're thinking about today for the first time. Excellent answer. So for all of our colleagues from across the Commonwealth that are listening, you're on notice that there will be a call to actions to start preparing now and hopefully there's good work underway so it's not a matter of starting something new but how to take what you're currently doing to a different level. Um, Thank you, my dear friend, colleague, uh, Dr. Pam Cipriano and, and Bobby Chabra. I miss my UVA family. Thank you very much, Dr. Terry Babineau. Um, thank you to my friend, Tracy Hoke, who, as she always says, knew me when I had hair. Um, and um, last but not least, my, my dear friend, um, Corey, I remember when he first joined the UVA family years ago, and his dear wife, Jennifer, thank you all very much for your, your, your time and contributions this morning. As we near the top of the hour, we're going to move into an intermission. We've put together a compilation of videos and slide clips from over the past 10 years um, that will show some of the work that's been occurring among Virginia hospitals. Um, it's about 15, 20 minutes long, so we'll start it at 12 o'clock and then it will be repeated at 1220 and then repeated at 1240. So feel free to go and grab some lunch, um, get a drink, take a break. And we look forward to seeing everyone back together at one o'clock for the final um, hour and a half of our, our, our 2021 summit. Thanks everyone. <laughs>